Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Michael Ponty and we're going to be talking about that transition from single family dwellings to multifamily and how you're able to do that successfully. I'm so excited that Michael's here to share his knowledge with us. Before we get into it, Michael, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Michael, thank you so much for joining us uh, and talking a little bit about that transition that a lot of investors are interested in making from single family dwellings, duplexes, triplexes, to the bigger things, the tens, the twelves, the fifteens, the eighteens. Um, so I'm excited to pick your brain before we get into it. Uh, give us a bit of a background on who you are as a real estate investor and tell us mm. a little bit about yourself. Sure. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. It's always great to connect with other investors literally across the country. So thank you, Darren, for really appreciate this. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Ponte. Uh, I own a company called Prosperity Real Estate Investments. I've uh, been investing for roughly around 20 years. Um, and with that being said, you know, been, uh, you know, kind of first started with single family homes, like a lot of people started and then slowly kind of migrated and, and changed and strategies changed, goals changed, and then started to kind of migrate over to more of the multifamily world. Um, so again, that journey started probably around 2010 when I started moving into more of the multifamily side. And and, uh, you know, for me, I'm a big believer, just kind of transitioning slowly, learning from some of your mistakes before you start taking on some of those really big leaps. And so that's been kind of a, the process for myself. And as we continue to learn, can, still to this day, we try to adapt and adjust and improve our systems constantly. Um, and so for a lot of our transactions right now, um, you know, a long time ago, I started purchasing properties just on my own personally with my own personal properties and then started obviously raising capital as well, joint venture capital, working with partners that had similar mindsets and goal sets as myself. And yeah, and that's kind of just the direction that we've been uh, pursuing um, with our portfolio and our properties. So, you know, we have properties in Alberta, we have some properties in BC, Calgary, we've got stuff in Halifax, uh, soon to be in New Brunswick as well. Um, so yeah, we've got properties kind of all over the place and many different strategies and many different ways, but that's kind of been our big focus. Uh, specifically, we're in more of a kind of more of a burr and multifamily strategy in, in regards to increasing valuations. And that's kind of the way we play. So, so what was that, that moment um, that you decided to go to the multifamily side? Was there something that you just realized um, that maybe you just, you had the ability to do it, or you just had um, sort of a, a light bulb moment that said, okay, now I want to buy this. Or did something just come across your plate that was like in that, you know, six plus unit range. And you decided, I think I can probably do this. Yeah. The, the honest truth was ego actually is what me got, got me started. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so, it gets, uh, gets most uh, of us a long way. Let, let, uh, let's be very blunt. Right. So like the reality is, you know, when you've done a lot of single family properties and you're like, okay. And, and you know, this too, Darren, it's just like, they become cookie cutter. It's just like, it's the same box and you just kind of cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. And it's great as long as everything's performing appropriately, but sometimes you just want to challenge yourself a little bit. And so for me, um, it was a little bit of ego. I actually didn't really know what the hell I was doing when it came to multifamily. And so um, I did want to tip my toes in the water. And that's the way I approach all, everything is mm -hmm. if I'm going into a new market, I'm tipping my toes in it. First of all, just to understand the markets and a new strategy, same thing. And so I started kind of off with suite of duplex, even though that isn't truly commercial multifamily, I yeah. just wanted to understand the landscape of some of the challenges that come along with it, with having multiple tenants um, under one roof and from that perspective. And so I learned a lot from going into that segment and I realized from that point that there's some pretty big opportunities that, that come along with it in the, in the income side, from the cash flow side, from those particular properties and you know get economies of scale. And that was kind of a little bit of my aha moment. Um, it wasn't until um, I started buying my very first multifamily, which was a nine unit apartment building and really dove into the world of commercial financing and commercial. And for those of you guys that are on this right now and listening, it's, it's a different world. So I want to be very clear on this is when you when you are going down the residential road to go to multifamily, you need to understand the way it's being assessed, the way you acquire the it's very, very different. And so for me, that property was my, um, my, my baptism, I guess, is the best way to relay it. Mm -hmm. It was there is really when I started to understand a lot about how to acquire it, how to manage it, all of those things. 
but more importantly is how to increase valuation and where every single dollar is extremely important to increase the value of it because it's very different than when you're looking at a residential deal where you know you're managing comparables and seeing what those numbers are and as long as they're in the same vicinity same box they're pretty much the same where in multifamily you can have two properties side by side same size same everything with complete different valuations just because of income higher expenses lower whatever the case may be and so you know my 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 claim is just that when you're getting into the multifamily world you you treat it like a business and so if you think about uh, a coffee shop you're about to buy a coffee shop and the coffee's valuation is how much income it's actually producing or net income or money going into your pocket and that's how they base the value and so the same thing needs to be applied when you deal with multifamily so um, for me, I didn't have that aha moment. I didn't have that thing. Cause again, it was for me, it was just about changing things, getting a little bit bored and that's the wrong way to do it. But at the same time, um, when I did get into it, it just opened my eyes to what the opportunities were. Right. So, so let's talk about some of those differences. Cause I'd love to dive in. You talked to touch sure. on the financial part of it a little bit, but let's kind of mm -hmm. go back and let's talk about the difference in single family dwelling and, and I'll call duplexes yep. and triplexes, those small multis versus the, the larger multis. Um, how do we acquire those? That's the biggest question I get. I want to get into this space, but how do I, you know, am I talking to my realtor about this? Like what's, what's the process and how do I find and start finding multifamily uh, properties? For sure. It's, it's, um, it can be as easy as finding your realtor and you can still go through the same process of MLS, but to be really honest with you, and, and you'll hear this over and over and over again, I'm sure you've heard this even on the residential side, as soon as it's hit come at kind of MLS specifically in multifamily, it's already been picked through a million times over. So it's already done. And so when you are looking, if you guys are looking to get into this, it's really creating a whole new team to be very honest is your residential realtor most likely has very little experience when it comes to multifamily. So you really need to find a good, solid, experienced, knowledgeable multifamily realtor to begin with. And these individuals, they are, you know, shaking hands, kissing babies, really building connections with these owners. And um, technically in every single market, if you've got one apartment building and you have a particular owner of that apartment building, that same owner most likely owns multiple buildings within that same community. So when your realtors made that connection with that, with that owner, he's made that connection, not just for the one building, but in most likely multiple buildings. And his job is to kind of keep keep his feelers out, keep touching base, keep reconnecting with them just to see when they may be wanting to sell for many different reasons. And so you're dealing with a much smaller pool of individuals that you're dealing with. And so having good solid realtors in your team is, is a big one. Secondly, and it's a good, good strategy to reference, if you've got a good market or a good area that you are wanting to, to purchase in, um, it's almost building a database of the, here's the address, here's the name of the owners, here's the contact and just reaching out. No different than a lot of people are out there knocking on doors and, and doing wholesaling deals and stuff like that. Same thing applies with, with uh, multifamily, except it's a smaller, smaller segment. And so building those relationships with those owners in advance is, is key because um, the, there's a lot of deals in multifamily that happen that are never, ever listed. And mm. those are really some of your best deals. And most of these things are pocket listings within realtors, never ever listed on MLS. So it's having a plethora of individuals kind of on your team to help go out there and start exploring it. So let's talk about then how you get to be top of mind for them. Um, mm -hmm. Because if that's the case, if it's, if it's somewhat competitive and you know, it's done internally, you know, if you're waiting for the property to hit the MLS, that's not going to happen. So how do you get to be front of mind for your people in your local market? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it goes right back to relationships. It's just one of the most important parts. And, and secondly is, you know, you build these relationships with your realtors, making sure that when you're going to go into this multifamily space, that you have clarity of the expectations of the things that you need to have. There's nothing worse. And, you know, again, small space reputation, be it yourself as a, as a buyer or a seller is instrumental. It's just so key because if all of a sudden you said, you know what, I'm going to buy this 15 unit apartment building and here's this realtor that says, you know what, I'm going to give Mike a shot at this thing. You brought me in, we're proceeding accordingly. 
And then you come in and you say, you know what? I thought I had the money. I don't have the money. And now that agent is looking very embarrassed in front of this other agent. Again, they're very well connected. So now the confidence level between these two agents aren't very keen. And here's people spending their time and energy and effort to go out there and do the work on your behalf, but you have not followed through. It's okay not to follow through as long as there's situations that, that pertain. You know, the appraisal doesn't work out, the, the spec. But if it's based on you not being organized and prepared and, and knowing your numbers, um, then that's it's going to kill you. And, and you do two or three of those or four of those, your reputation has just gone completely out the window. And no offense, your name has been presented to your realtor, which your realtor may no longer want to work with you. And your name has also been passed on to the selling agents. Again, small industry, maybe a handful of people. And there's like, oh yeah, I remember that Mike Pawnee guy. He never ever closes on his deal because he knows what he's doing. And now that's going to impact you in your whole market. So before you kind of go down that road, just make sure you have the, an understanding of what is expected. And the biggest fail point that I tend to see out there is truly understanding the capital that's required to close on these deals. Mm. Like, you know, you're dealing, it's, it's a lot of money. And so, you, you, and, and it's okay, as long as you understand it, don't try to skinny this, this deal to make it work, but have it ready to go to proceed forward. There's nothing worse that you're going in, putting a bunch of offers in, and then you have one accepted and you can't follow it through. And that's mm -hmm. really embarrassing for everybody involved and it just ruins your reputation. So let's yeah. dive into uh, due diligence because due diligence yep. is a little bit different on the multifamily side than on the, on the residential side. Absolutely. What are the main differences when you're in that, you know, conditional phase of a, of an accepted offer um, that is different on the residential side versus the commercial side? For sure. It's and great questions. Like the reality is the due diligence, very, very different. And so what happens is, you know, there's longer closing periods, especially right now for financing. It's just a nightmare, especially if you're trying to get CMHC financing. 90 yeah. days, 120 days is not uncommon, just so you be aware. So the timelines that you are used to in residential, they throw those completely out the window. They're not anywhere close to what you're seeing in multifamily. So mm -hmm. uh, financing alone, 60, 90, 120 days is very common in regards to doing an engineering report, environmental, all these things. I'll, I'll touch on all that in a second. So again, with those ones, again, probably another 30, 45 days out. So technically by the time you got your offer accepted to you removing conditions, which is usually about 60 days, 90 days, and then expect another 30 days to actually come to closure, you know, between 90 to 120 days is very, very common when it comes to the multifamily side. So just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the due diligence, and this is the most important part, as I kind of highlighted earlier, it's like you're buying a coffee shop. And so what you're doing is you've got an offer accepted in this deal, but you want to make sure that the seller, that this, what the seller's providing you in a format called the pro forma, which is just highlighting your income, all the expenses, um, and then the net operating income is accurate. And so for your job when it comes to due diligence is making sure that what's been presented to you to make that decision of the purchase price matches with what is actuality. So, um, you know, if they're saying that the rent for per month is around, you know, $10,000 a month. And so every year you're producing $120,000 uh, of income. But then when you look at the actual number, it's coming in at like, $98,000, there is a discrepancy of 20 grand. Well, that changes what your valuation is and what the banks are going to provide you for financing. So your job is to go through this with like with a fine tooth comb to making sure everything. So you're looking at the rent roll for, for the tenants. Secondly, you're looking at the lease agreements. Then you're looking at the something referencing called as a profit and loss statement, or, or and that is your income minus all your expenses by month. And then you're just determining that everything is everything is accurate. So you're getting all the financials from the property, just like a coffee shop, you're seeing all the financials. And what, again, you're trying to make sure everything's a match. Uh, utility bills, you know, are the utility bills accurate? Insurance, um, you know, the one piece that I'm talking to a lot of my students on as well, and, and you're probably seeing this too, Darren, because it's a nightmare, is insurance cost of what you were getting before. And if you acquire a brand new property today, um, it may be, sorry, if you're acquiring this particular property, that doesn't mean you're getting the same insurance as what the seller's got. In fact, the cost is probably 30, 40, 50% higher. So, you know, part of your due diligence is get an insurance quote just to determine this because that may have a real big impact in your overall numbers. 
And so your job is to make sure you've got all of your bases covered. And then the second part to this is other things that you'll be doing in regards to kind of a similar to a home inspection. You're doing an, um, an engineering report. So you're just double checking, make sure the boiler and the hot water tanks are all working, the roof's in good condition, no issues with electrical, all of those things. But uh, with, with those pieces, there's obviously higher expenses because it's a commercial mm -hmm. building. So hopefully that explains it in a general format, but yeah. That's, that's exactly what I was, was going for. And you answered it brilliantly. Thank you so much for breaking that all down. And I think one of the things that, you know, you mentioned was the difference between uh, approaching the seller, him or her, and, and saying like, you know, this is, these are the numbers. We're not negotiating based on, on the residential side, which is based on a lot of your times you're dealing with homeowners, right? Now yes. you're dealing with another investor and it's very easy for you to say, these numbers don't add up. And that's why I have to offer you this for your building versus somebody else's. I've lived in this home for 20 years. <laughs> My children were raised here. I think it's worth this much money. Exactly. That's, a, that's a conversation with a homeowner as opposed to with another investor. It's like the numbers don't work. Here's why my offer is what it is, or here's why the offer needs to be adjusted. And I think that's why uh, a huge benefit to multifamily as well. Very much so. Yeah, like you said, you're not going to get that emotional play that you would tend to get in the residential side. It is, it's always based on the numbers, 100%. You deal with a lot of sophisticated investors in multifamily and not so as well, because people are just, you know, I'm dealing with that right now. I've got somebody, this is a second generation property, multifamily, fully paid off. This is this been a the golden goose, you know, just laying the egg every single month. But now they're just like, I see a big, big check at the end. And I think I'm just going to take it. And so for them, there's not a lot of sophistication there. Um, mm -hmm. So with that being said, you, you need to make sure that they, you may have to do a little bit of education, but it is always a hundred percent based on what the numbers are. Mm -hmm. You explained a little bit about how the net operating income and the cap rate um, work together, but combine yep. that with how financing is different on the commercial side as well. Yeah, it's a good point. So the, the banks are looking at the deal very, very differently. So in, in the residential side, they're obviously looking at you, the individual, for financing. So your debt service, your credit score, all of those types of things. And it's not to say that that doesn't hold uh, true in commercial, but it isn't the number one criteria. So for them, the banks are looking at this as I am financing a business, just like we talked about at the coffee shop as an example. How is the business performing? How do I know I'm going, how this business is going to be paying my mortgage? So they're looking at the liability and the risk of the project in itself to see that it is, you know, it's, it's solid. So that's the first priority for them is they're saying, okay, right now, you know, looking at the income line, looking at the expense line, maybe the expenses are too high for whatever reason. So there's some risk that's associated with that because it doesn't match what the averages are. Um, so with that being said, little concern from that perspective. Um, so for you, you really are needing to, when it comes to the financing, it's, it's really almost kind of preparing kind of a business plan uh, to the bank. And so, you know, for us, we use a template that we, we always provide is like, this is the project to begin with. And then secondly, what's our strategy when it comes to, to the project as well. So it is kind of our financing business plan. So when we disclose that back to our bank, they see exactly kind of what our strategy is in regards to current, current current scenario, where we plan to do that, where we're planning to grow it based on increasing rents, reducing expenses, and where we're trying to align this thing. And really, it's all about confidence and sophistication is really one of the things the banks are paying really close attention to is number one, it's great that the property's performing and it, and it may be doing really well. But who are the people that are going to be managing the business, just like the coffee shop, the proper the business itself may be performing well when you're buying this project because it's being managed well by the seller. But as soon as you take it over, you may just run it straight to the ground. So part of it is they want to determine who this individual is as well that is going to be overseeing this and, and sophistication. So when we talked about reputation, it is, it's equally true when it comes to financing because if you're dealing with a mortgage broker or your conventional banks and, the, and you've got a bank representative, which I highly encourage you guys to build relationships with, they're just like, oh, it's another Mike Ponte project. You know, the, look, based on his history, it's always been working out well. More confidence that goes along with it. So when it comes to financing, they're looking at the property first and foremost. They want to obviously see the performance of it, of current reality. They're looking at you, secondly, as an individual, as an investor, uh, highlighting some of your experience. And you can use your experience from residential, highlighting that, hey, we've got experience in investing in real estate and sharing that information. And now you're just moving on to the multifamily world. And then thirdly, you know, they're obviously going to want personal guarantees. They are going to be asking for that information. The banks want their protection 
for everything. They're going to get paid one way or another. Um, so the reality is that does not change. But um, when for those of us that are maybe stuck when it gets into residential side, and we, I was talking about this even earlier today is, you know, that's one of the nice advantages about commercial uh, multifamily is because once you get stuck in the residential world or they've cut you off at four or five properties personally, they're like, okay, where do I go from here? Where multifamily is a little bit of a different avenue where you can actually set up a corporation. And technically the corporation is actually qualifying for the mortgage. Uh, it, it's uh, the property itself is the one that's actually qualifying for the property itself. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility when doing this. So the banks right now, um, especially with the situation with the pandemic, they're loving multifamily because multifamily is one of those stable, solid assets. And, and the best part about it, even in a situation where properties are foreclosed, being foreclosed on, God forbid that that happens, but if that situation ever comes ahead, people still need a place to live no matter what. So they're going to either rent you know, a house, a townhouse, but apartments are your lowest common denominator, it's your lowest expense. So for people that is always high demand when it comes to the apartment building segment. And the best part about it is there's so many different ways to increase valuation on multifamilies in an up market, down market, there's so many ways to do it. And that's, for me, I love that strategy when it comes to multifamily, because there's so, we're not so determined on what's happening with the market. It's, there's just so many other ways of kind of making money on it, so. Michael, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to, to join us and walk through this. I think it's super valuable for many people that are looking to make that leap into that next uh, phase of investing. And I think it's a natural progression for many people to start, Agreed. like you say, you know, um, get a little bit of a feel for investing first before biting off that 12 unit building as your, as your first transaction. So yeah. uh, you're a great example for many people of how that can be done very successfully. So thanks again for, for walking us through that. Thank you. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session with Michael, you know what to do, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and feel free to leave comments and questions, both from Michael and for myself. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. With that, I'll say, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. I wish you the best of success in your real estate investing journey. And I look forward for hopefully our paths being able to cross at some point in the near future when the country opens back up and we can all start traveling <laughs> again. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Awesome. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Darren. Thank Have you. Appreciate day. it. You too.